July 16, 2013 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda as follows. First, the approval of the minutes from the June 18, 2013 Planning Board meeting, followed by the Town Planner's Report. New business with uh, 10 Clinton Road Private Access Way Permit Amendments, followed by the Strout Tower FAA Site Plan Amendment. Then Building Permit Notification Zoning Amendment, followed by the Normal High Water Line Definition Zoning Amendment. And then any public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, and followed by uh, the adjournment. So the first order of business is approval of the minutes. Um, anyone have any comments, questions about the minutes? Seeing none, would anyone like to make a motion? Move their approved as presented. Okay, second. Second. Repeat, second. Okay, any discussion on the minutes? And then, um, seeing none, um, everyone for the minutes? Approve the minutes? Okay, and um, abstaining? Abstaining? Okay. Okay, next is the town planner's report, Maureen. A very, very short report. I'm not going to mention the town center plan because I'm going to defer to Planning Board Member Curry, who is the Planning Board's designee on the town center plan committee. The Conservation Commission is continuing to work on the Greenbelt Plan. The Greenbelt, the Conservation Commission is a seven-member volunteer group, and they are they have finished the public forum phase of the Greenbelt Plan, and they are now working to finish that plan. They will finish it, and then they will send it on to the council, where the council will start working on it. We've had a tremendous amount of interest. We have um, 50 people attending every meeting. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. That's right, Peter. Emma's. Would you please update us on? Yeah, the, um, we've had now several meetings. I think the committee is progressing in a reasonable fashion. We've had a detailed site walk led by Maureen. Um, we met last night and had a fairly extensive brainstorming session in which a whole a lot of ideas and issues were put down and on big pieces of art paper and pasted to the wall and discussed at length. And um, the next step, I think, is Maureen is going to try to synthesize and refine these uh, for our um, August meeting. And at that point, we hope to have some goals and priorities starting to emerge. We're also scheduled or trying to schedule a meeting with the library committee uh, next month, which is part of our mission. So all things, I think things are moving along at a reasonable pace. Maureen, please feel free to. No, it was actually, they had a very interesting discussion about the town center vision. And I would strongly, I, I really think it was an update of the vision. Um, things that were new and uh, not so much 100% uh, supported when the vision was adopted in 90, 1995 or now considered uh, so integrated into the fabric of the town center that why are we even mentioning it? So it's, it's kind of an interesting discussion. That's good. Thank you both. Okay, the next item on the agenda is 10 Clinton Road Private Access Way per Permit Amendment. June O'Neill is requesting amendments to the previously granted private access way permit to move the utility connection and allow a garden in the southwest corner of the lot located at 10 Clinton Road. This will be under section 19-7-9, private access way permit amendment with a public hearing. Um, the, <clears throat> this will be addressed in the following format. There will be an introduction of the item by the town planner, followed by a presentation by the applicant. The board will then discuss the application as either an amendment or a full new review. This item will then be open for a public hearing and will be followed by further discussion from the board and a motion from the board to consider. And um, it was in your notes, but it, could you just please remind the board what would be the difference between um, just looking at this as an amendment item um, as it would differ from a full new review? Sure. Um, site plan review procedures are laid out in the uh, back of the zoning ordinance and it requires a formal finding of completeness and um, a formal motion for approval. Amendments, uh, the provisions basically say that if once you get an approved plan, you have to build what's on the approved plan or you have to come back to the planning board for an amendment. 
So typically what the board has done is you haven't required that all the information for a full site plan is submitted. You've only required the information that is pertinent to the amendment. So, <coughs> excuse me. There isn't a requirement that you make a formal finding of completeness, but rather you should just look at what's been provided, compare it to what's being asked as an amendment, and make sure you've got enough information. So that's more kind of a consensus. Do we have enough to move forward? Um, obviously, if you think something is a huge change, you can treat it as a full new site plan review. Um, but things at this level are typically treated as amendments. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, if the applicant would like to uh, address the board. Yes, good evening, board members, Madam Chair, Stephen Moore, Moore and Sarah and Landscape Architects, here on behalf of June O'Neill. June's with me. My <clears throat> quick summary is as follows. We came to you in a workshop to discuss a couple of small changes to the plan. One of them, I think, is fairly straightforward and an interpretive issue for the board which is our request to show a garden area 90 feet by 45 feet just outside the building window. And again, we discussed that at workshop, but the issue there is that June wants to install a vegetable garden, no structures, no additional impervious area outside of the building envelope. So we want to show that on the amended recording plan. The second change is June has recorded the easement that exists from the north side of the property out to Oakwood and is proposing to run the three utility lines from the house site north out of the site to Oakwood rather than installing those in the new driveway. It, and those are the two changes. The issue, as the board may recall with this, is when Wynn Pillsbury brought forward the original application, there was a tremendous amount of discussion and focus on the driveway, the driveway geometry, turnaround and emergency access. And then the issues about the house placement and its relationship to the pond. None of what we're proposing affects those issues that the board spent most of the time deliberating about. So the essence of our request, don't you love my high-tech graphics? <clears throat> Is that blue easement that's shaded on here in the fluorescent blue running from lot A to the north to Oakwood, and then the little green um, area for the garden, 90 by 45. So in terms of actual changes to the plan that you signed before for the approval, those would be the two changes. My hopefully persuasive discussion points about this being treated as amendment by you folks is that we're not substantively changing the key parts of the original um, discussions about the private way in terms of access, egress, safety issue, law size, none of those issues change. The only thing we're requesting the board approval for is to route our utilities to the north and then in essence use grass as that vegetable garden area. We've submitted into the record a copy of the easement, this plan, and um, June now owns the property. I think we discussed that with you at the last meeting. So things are moving forward. The driveway work is proceeding as designed. And so we really just need the board to look at this, make that consideration, and then give us that direction. We've read the information from Maureen. We are perfectly comfortable with the direction and the findings should the board deem it appropriate to move that way. So with that, I'll turn it back to the board to answer any questions or let you open the public hearing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the board then, would you like to look at this as an amendment or a full new review, and if it's an amendment, do you feel you have enough information? Any thoughts? thoughts I, think I think it should be an amendment. I think we have all the information we need. And over here? Yeah. Same? Yes. Okay. And Great. sufficient information to proceed on this amendment? Okay. Then we'll be looking at it as Thank you. an amendment. Thank you. Okay. Then does the board have any comments or questions for the applicant? or? would like to discuss this. I have one question. Uh, Steve, on the uh, property line on uh, Thomas Wilbur and Diane Broadbent's property, it's the one uh, to the left of the driveway. South of the garden? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
by the district rules, the setback from that property line would be 20 feet. Right? Correct. Okay. Yes, Lane. You mentioned that there are to be no structures in the garden area, and I'm trying to figure out where that is specified. Is there any place on the plans that makes that provision? I believe we covered that in one of the notes. That, I, and I'm trying to determine which of the notes covers that. Thank you. I will look. I didn't exactly see that. Uh, lot 11 says no additional impervious surface area shall be constructed in the garden. So a structure, is an would, a structure would create an impervious surface area? I think it would be really hard to come up with this. I mean, I guess you could use the grass creek type things, but I just don't. Because usually when we talk about structures and we talk about impervious surfaces, right. we, we don't talk about them as though they were the same, but, but perhaps if, if that's... If that covers it, then that's... It would probably be better to just state that in that note. I mean, I think Maureen's right. You can't really... No structures or other impervious. Straw hut. Well, number seven does speak to that somewhat. Mm -hmm. No construction or other than the way Oh, no, I'm sorry. Right, it doesn't quite address it, No, though. I'm sorry. That, that was a different point. My cover letter mentioned the structures, but it's not a note. You're correct. It's just... Does the applicant have any problem with amending note 11 to explicitly say no structures? None whatsoever. There's, there's no intention to construct structures. In so the second sentence of note 11 would just say no structures or additional imp or other additional impervious area shall be constructed in the garden. No problem. Great. Thank you. And I guess the only other thing I wanted to say is I'm really glad we're getting this back as an amendment because I think it's important to acknowledge that although creating a garden is a great thing, it's not the same thing as leaving an area undisturbed. So I appreciate the fact to have the opportunity to make that absolutely clear on the plan. Thank you. I agree. Anyone else? I have a question. I, yes. It was brought up at the workshop, but I can't honestly remember the answer. I believe the uh, utility easement is going uphill from wherever the building is going to be to this is this is uphill. I mean uphill towards. That is so correct. It's uphill from the house site. So you're going to have to have a pump to pump it. Yes. So my question is, what happens if the pump breaks down? Does it end up by flooding anybody else? I mean, is there any other problems involved in that? It doesn't. There's a there's a sealed chamber. There's about a two and a half day storage tank associated with the pump chamber. So if the pump stops pumping, when that gets up, the first 300 gallons, an alarm goes off, a light goes on in the house. She's got another 400 gallons, another day and a quarter to get that fixed and reconnected. It was going to pump regardless. It, would, it couldn't get there by gravity from the original location. It was going to have to pump to a gravity line and then go down the driveway in the original design. So we were pumping. So the worst case scenario, if everything fails, it'll end up in the hollow, wherever that is. If everything fails, it ends up in June's house, not down in the pond. <laughs> All right, thank you. Anyone else? The only notes that I would like to uh, point out is that um, you've done a lot of, you've included a lot of research to us and the deeds that have been signed and, and other documents, and, um, and then you reference them in your notes. Um, I would like to add um, that the book and the page for each of those documents that you've done all the research on onto the actual plat. So that information will always be there. Okay. So that would be item number three would have, uh, is recorded in deed book 213, page 277. And then item number eight, um, there's, that would also be recorded, and that would be uh, page 30668. It was actually the book, and the page is 279. There is a typo on there. I'm not sure. You may be already I, I knew that. Yeah, we'll clean up the typo. Maureen pointed that out to me. Okay. <laughs> and then item uh, 12 
and that is a recorded in deed book 30768, page 61. So just add those. We'll always have some reference to okay. those, along with the other change we're making to note number 11. But that would be it, and no others? No? Then, at this time, would anyone like to make a motion? Thank you, Elaine. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Ms. June O'Neill is requesting amendments to the previously approved private access way permit for 10 Clinton Road, Lot A, to relocate utility connections and install a garden outside the building envelope, which requires review under Section 1979. The proposed amendment two, the proposed amendment should be added to the previously approved plan to create one set of approved plans. Number three, construction details of utility connections in the road should be included on the plans. Number four, this approval supplements the prior approval and all requirements except for installation of utilities in the driveway and the, the garden still applies. Number five, the application substantially complies with the private access way provisions section 19-7 dash nine. Um, I'd like to go back under item four that I just read. This approval supplements the prior approval and all requirements except for the installation of utilities in the driveway and the addition of a garden still apply. So it's just the two words addition of a the three words before the word garden. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of June O'Neill for an amendment to the previously approved private access way road for 10 Clinton Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the plans be revised in <coughs> accordance with the town engineer's letter dated July 10, 2013. Two, that the amendments, one, relocating the utility connections for the new home from the driveway to the utility easement connecting to Oakwood Road, and two, allowing a garden as shown outside the building envelope be added to the previously approved plans. The town staff shall review the plans to confirm the amendments. Three, note 11 on the plan as presented to the planning board shall be amended such that the second sentence of note 11 shall read, no structures or other additional impervious area shall be constructed in the garden. Number four, references in notes three, eight, and 12 to recorded documents shall be amended to include the recording book and page. And number five, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised, signed by the planning board, and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? And that passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. I have to amend that. <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay, the next item on our agenda is the uh, Strout, where is it? Strout Tower FAA Site Plan Amendment. The Strout family, represented by SBA Network Services, LLC, is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to add two concrete pads to support utility and communication equipment for an additional antenna to be added to the tower under Section 19-9 Site Plan Amendment with a public hearing. Okay, this agenda item will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide an overview, 
followed by a presentation by the applicant. The proposed amendment will then be open for public comment regarding completeness of the application. The board will then discuss completeness, followed by a motion for the board to consider. A public hearing will then follow, and the board will then decide if a site walk should be scheduled, followed by a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, can you provide us with an overview? Sure. Um, typically with a site plan, or site plan amendment, you would make the finding of completeness, and then if you deem it complete, you would schedule a public hearing and or site walk for the following month. Uh, when this came to you in a workshop, you uh, were attempting to expedite the application and agreed to schedule a, com a completeness and a public hearing for the same evening. That was contingent upon the applicant submitting at the end of that month and then the following month you were going to schedule a site walk um, at the workshop. But this wasn't an item on the site on the workshop. The applicant did not submit at the end of the month. The whole none of no site walk has ever been scheduled. So the structure for tonight is as you requested. There's been an advertised public hearing for this evening. You can make determination of completeness or not, um, but no site walk has been held. I just mention this because if you want to hold a site walk, you probably should not approve it tonight. Um, if you approve it tonight, there's no point in holding a site walk. Uh, so you're, you're going to have to make a decision. Are there any questions? Thank you. Okay. Would the applicant like to present the proposed amendment. I'm Justin Strout. Uh, I represent the tower owner. And I just wanted to go over a few things, um, basically from the memorandum provided by Maureen. Um, it looks like uh, we're just making an amendment to an existing, um, I guess you'd call it a subdivision, but it's an uh, existing 180-foot tower. We're trying to add... Uh, two slabs, one would be for holding the, the uh, propane tank and one would be for holding the actual equipment in a generator. Um, the dimensions of the area we're, we're trying to, uh, to add is 16 feet wide by 10 feet deep and it would be added to an existing fenced in area already. Um, it does not have any real effect on your stormwater because uh, there's no impervious surface there now or there it's an impervious surface now it's basically uh, a ledge outcropping and we're going to be putting some concrete slabs on it so it's not going to change that that much um, basically um, I don't know if you have any specific questions but I have a bunch of pictures that I can show I tried to to basically give you a site walk without having to give you a site walk and I have no problem with a site walk. Um, I'd prefer <laughs> to get things moving because there was a, an issue between communication between Excellus, who is actually the company that, that's providing the antennas, and uh, ourselves. And delaying things <laughs> into the next month is going to hurt them, not us. So um, do you have any very specific questions, or do you want me to just walk through this whole memorandum? Um, well, I know I want to go through the completeness with the board. Okay. So I want to start with um, if you want to address anything under completeness that may have changed. Okay. We, um, one of the questions that was uh, asked was about the lighting. And there is a 100-watt floodlight that will be mounted at an angle facing the equipment. This floodlight is on a rotational timer that has a maximum of 30 minutes. So a site tech has like, it's like a weatherproof box. He flips open, turns the dial, the light comes on. If he leaves, it goes off in 30 minutes. So there's no, um, there's no real, I don't see any real issue with that because I mean that would be under normal, you know, if, if a homeowner had an issue and had, had to light something, I don't think that would be a problem. Um, then we basically, we haven't changed anything because we're not adding roads. Um, the only thing that we're changing is most likely if CMP sees fit, we may add a different transformer um, to, to meet the power demand. It's only a 100 amp service that they're installing, which is probably smaller than most houses nowadays. So I don't even know if they're going to need to update the transformer. But if they do, they basically will come in and change the transformer, and it'll be in its existing location. Um, so. 
I mean, everything else, just, it hasn't changed. So if you want me to walk through these point for point, I can, but I think well, the... I can uh, turn it to the board. I would point out that um, it did say we did not have information on your financial capabilities. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I, do you need a copy of that, Maureen? They, they have it. We have it. Okay. So we, All right. We've covered that item then. We All right. do have that now. But on completeness, um, does yeah, if you, you okay. I mean, if you'd like to see the actual uh, site locations here. But under completeness, would the board have any questions about is this complete that we can proceed? Any well, questions just, under completeness? Uh, we're not in any way considering the addition of the additional antennas on the tower, right? The only thing before us are these concrete pads. Right. The, the way the town regulates commercial towers is that you get permission, you get site plan review of the tower, and then you only need a building permit to install antennas. What's triggering the site plan review is the, the support buildings at the base of the tower, because the support buildings are non-residential structures, and any non-residential structure still triggers site plan review. Okay. Anyone have any questions on the completeness of this item? Yes, what, Henry? What, is this a microwave tower? Or? No, and it's, it's a cellular tower, and we're not, Sorry, it's a cellular tower? It has cellular? Cellular. S cellular. Like cell phones? Cell phones. Okay. Yes. Um, we're, and, and I don't know, I know this board is, is relatively new to tower endeavors. <laughs> so I just don't want, I want to make sure you're not confusing an antenna and a tower. There is a tower, there's a 180 foot tower there currently. We are adding an antenna which mounts to the side of an existing tower. Some people think that an antenna is the tower. So, okay. Um, and if, and if you guys have generic questions, since you haven't really dealt with towers as well, I can answer those, you know, I understand okay. how I'll, it can be. I'll get to those in a moment. Okay. Um, so the board does not have anything around completeness, because I do need to open it up to the public, if no one has any questions. Can I, can I ask one question? Certainly. Does the antenna affect the height, the top height? Okay, thank no. you. Then I will be opening this to the public. Would anyone like to address the completeness of this application? Seeing no one, I will close that. And um, then we have found this complete and we can proceed. Okay, do I need to take a formal vote on that? Okay, would someone like to make a motion on completeness then? Yeah, it's the last. Sure, Henry. Yeah. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the fact presented, the application of John Stout, Stout, Stout sorry, representing the Stout family for an amendment of the previously approved site plan to add an equipment cabinet, generator, and fuel cylinder to the area at the base of an existing tower located on Stout Road be deemed complete. Motion to the table. Oh, oh, we'll stop you there. And yeah, <laughs> would anyone like to second that? Second. Thank you. And any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in, oh, I'm sorry. I would just yes. like to state for the record that it is Justin Strout, not John. Justin Strout, Oh, I didn't catch that, thank you. All those in favor and opposed, and that completeness passes unanimously. Okay, then at this time, um, we'll be looking the rest of this application. So that was completeness. So we'll be looking under the site plan review standards. Okay. Um, then let's do the public hearing at this point. Anyone would like to talk on this item? Seeing none, I am closing the public hearing. Okay. And now, um, would any, does anyone have any questions or would they like Justin to talk about the site plan a little bit more? I'd like to see his pictures. Okay. Let's run through those pictures. Okay. Basically what I did is um, I actually, this is, this is a little bit larger than the area that we're going to be uh, laying out. And it looks a little funny because the ground's a little uneven. So I apologize for it not looking like an actual rectangle. But that's about 16 and a half feet wide 
by 11 feet deep right there. And we're asking for um, uh, basically it's 15.6, but it's going to probably be about 16 because that's where the fence posts lie by 10 feet. The plan is to actually remove those two segments of the fence in the front there, kind of by the X, and they would extend the fence out to make almost like a, a jut out. I don't know if, how you would classify that, but um, there's going to be no new gate because there's an existing gate there. Um, it's just going to be open to the rest of the compound. I have, this is another angle. This is showing the relationship to where the tower is. So you can see it's not very far from the tower. And we have from the ground, this is kind of looking from where your parking area is into the, to the compound. This is from the back side. Pretty much the same, you know, you're in 180 degrees looking at it from the rear. This is from the front on the road where you go to, to the turnaround in the parking area. This is from the road that goes down to the next tower, which is pretty much, it's, it's all really close proximity. Um, this is where the generator, I mean, excuse me, the generator, the propane tank would be. There's an existing, it's a much larger propane tank. I think that it's a thousand gallon, but I'm not sure. Um, the other one is, is uh, 250 gallon, I believe. And it would be going down there just to keep the propane tanks in one area rather than having them spread about the, you know, the site. And you can see the existing, this is from up, up in the corner of the existing site. So it would be going um, in that picture to the left, maybe about eight feet from there to keep it away from the road as well. And um, I know we, this was an issue of mine. The road has a, a uh, kind of like a swale next to it for drainage. So they're, they don't need a, a bollard, but I'm going to make them put a bollard anyways next to the tank just in case something happens. But somebody would have to run into a ditch and then up the side of the hill a little ways to hit the tank, and, and I don't think that would actually happen. This is actually looking up the road. Um, you can hardly see the site it's to the left. <laughs> This is the other existing tower and the site, and basically they're about 200 feet apart, maybe a little bit further. So you can see it's very well wooded. This is the existing site. There's, to the left is actually the roof of a building. And then I wanted to show you, this is um, it's what we call a canopy and an ice bridge. Basically, it's to protect the outdoor equipment and the tech in the middle of the winter from ice coming off the tower if they need to work underneath it so they don't get hit. This is from Google Earth. I know it's not really clear on here, but you can kind of see the two structures about in the middle of the picture. Those are the two existing towers. And basically, I'm trying to show that there is substantial buffer. Uh, a good portion of it is evergreen. There's also deciduous. The road that you see coming down the right side of that picture is Spurwink Ave. I couldn't get Wells Road into there, but it's a little bit further down because you can see the corner of Jordan Pond. This is, sorry, it couldn't be bigger, but it's a panorama. Um, I'm 225 feet away from the tower, and this is basically looking uh, parallel to Spurwink Ave. So that's what you see. And like I said, I'm 225 feet away from the structure. This is about the same distance. It's actually on the near, you know, closer to the other tower that I showed you. This is looking parallel to Wells Road. Um, this is at the end of essentially Strout Road. This is where the gate is so that the general public can't drive down there. And to the right, you can see the fenced in area. You really can't see the towers because they're, they're hidden by trees. That's looking down the road just after the gate. You can see the other tower, and then to the right is the fenced-in area, and like I said, our tower is behind those trees. This is an existing site somewhere else. I just asked for it so that you could see what, essentially what the slab looks like and what the equipment looks like. And I know on that drawing, there was a 28 pages of drawings that a lot of it was generic, but this is as close as we're gonna get to the equipment. Um, to the left side of that picture is what they call the H-frame or the, the utilities backer board. 
That's where the power comes in and the telco comes in. You can see the generator is behind it on, on the right, and that's what the propane tank would look like, except ours is going to be, a, I believe it's about 100 feet away from the site. Like I said, I want to nest it with the other tank. Again, this is another angle. That smaller box is the generator. Um, the larger box is the equipment. And I do not know if this site is going to be uh, exactly the same dimension-wise. It may be a little shorter. But you can see at the top of that middle box that there is a light. And that's how the 100-watt floodlight would be. So they'd turn that on, and it would just be covering the area that they're working on. This is a close-up of what the, the propane tank is going to look like in the slab. Um, because it's government, they bolt it down so that when we have a big earthquake, it won't tip over. Let's see. Okay, that's all I have for pictures. I have um, some of the actual drawings. If anybody has any questions on these pictures, I'd love to answer them. I can back up and go through them. Anyone have any questions on those? Okay. I'll send on the pictures. All right, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> Let me see if I can open these in preview. It'll be a little bit easier than opening them in Adobe. Were there any, any pages or questions you had on the 28 pages of detailed drawings? I actually had one question. Um, okay. I'm looking at um, plan C11, C.1.1, C1.1. And it has all the proposed items that are going up, and it also would say, like, um, C detail A dash E, C D sheet, C, you know, every one of them has something to refer back to. Yep. Uh, the proposed 10 by 13 concrete slab, which, yeah, you're grimacing. <laughs> which sheet this is that This back is to? very generic. I, I apologize. I, I almost wish they hadn't provided this because it seems like it was a lot of overkill. Um, I came into this after, after they'd already decided what they were going to do. You said you're looking at C11, uh, C-1.1. And do you see the note? It's, it says proposed 10 by 13 concrete slab. Right. And that's probably the only one that doesn't say go C sheet. Well, page. the... And so is there, I was looking at C10-C, that's the one I that came closest. Page C-10. And in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, C, is that the 10 by 13? Well, they'll probably have a generic for the slab is the problem. Because they have a generic for the gate, which isn't being used at this site. C-10. Is that the one? I think so, yes. Okay. I know the uh, town engineer went through these, but I just, that was the only one that didn't have a reference. What they did on this is they gave you actually a picture of what they would do on a standalone generator pad. This, this is going to be very similar, except it will be 10 by 13 instead of the generator dimensions. And they'll have the same design, but it's, this is all going on one slab. So they're not doing two slabs. The, the second slab that they're referring to originally is the, there's a slab of a three foot six by three foot six slab for the propane tank. Okay, so there is a reference in the plan that we yes. cover that. I also had a question on um, page C dash one. That's one of the first ones. Sorry, I just pulled my pages out of order. Sure. Okay. You have that? Right at the top, there's uh, next to where it says side notes, there's a smaller, much smaller box that just says note. Mm -hmm. It says site plan information contained herein is taken from the documents provided by the client. Now, could you provide a little bit more information on the documents that you provided, such as just what was the name of that plan, who prepared that plan, the date of the plan? I mean, do you know where you 
got this from and, and these these documents came from um, from the original plans from when we did the original site mm -hmm. so we just used you know it's kind of like a carbon copy and then sure added in because there wasn't any change to it like I said other than adding that little 10 by 16 area so it didn't didn't seem like it was worth doing a whole nother survey for something you know reinventing the wheel well I always like to have documentation on where gotcha you got this it, and it doesn't have to be any more detailed than um, some of the details that you would see on the side here who you know what is the name of the plan what's the date of the plan who made the plan just yep. some simple little information other than just say it was provided by the client it was provided by the client based on the following plan just so there's a reference it's always nice to have a reference to go okay. back to if there's ever yeah I, I believe originally this was provided by Sebago Technics for when we did the original site um, okay I'm 99% I'm sure of that I don't know if Maureen can answer that I'm pretty sure that these two foot contours came from the town's data. Okay. I did get a call from the client, from the uh, from the applicant, and referred them to our GIS consultant who hands out our town data upon request. Okay. So I think that part we know where it came from. Okay. Then that would be fine. I just wasn't sure if it was something that you had. You know, no, I I, okay. I didn't. I actually was hoping I had it, but I didn't. I couldn't provide it to them. That was okay. that was why we didn't pull up the ply. Okay as quickly as we thought because we needed the better topo. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. Those were the two that I had. Anyone else had any? Something, Carol? No. I had a question. Yes, ma'am. So this is a site plan amendment, right? Mm -hmm. Is there some place on here where we say that that's where we have a title box? Yeah, I see it doesn't. So I think we need something on here that says kind of getting back to Victoria's point, but probably on the cover sheet, it should say amendment to site plan, and then the reference data for the original site plan that's being amendment amended, because I see there are a lot of revisions dates on here, but they have nothing to do with the original site plan, and I don't see anything here that obviously connects this to the plan being amended. So I think we need to have a formal title block on here. Okay, I, didn't, I don't know if the narrative that came with the uh, enclosure, it references everything about being the amendment. But that should, because somebody's gonna be just have the plans and might not have the narrative when they're actually looking at it, okay. I think it should be on here too. Okay. The, the other thing is we got by email something from our town engineer. That's what came today, right? Mm -hmm. much, it, it strikes me that much of what's here is really beyond the scope of what a town engineer has anything at all to do with. And I'm somewhat concerned that the planning board and the town not be deemed to have approved technical details which we actually probably have not reviewed because they're you've given us so much detail I'm not sure we have the technical capability to review the kind of detail that you're given and I doubt we ask the town engineer to do that so I would like to be able to say somewhere that the only thing that we have reviewed are the technical issues that are within the scope of the site plan requirements, but that we have not reviewed and are not making any statement with respect to anything beyond that. Right. Yeah, we're, we're not exactly sure how or where to say that, but I think we should say that pretty prominently because I look at a lot of this and I say, well, I have the foggiest notion and I have a sense that maybe our town engineer has a little clearer notion, but not a complete one and certainly has not looked it over. Sorry, oh, sir, this, this is a fairly standard tower, right? The, the tower is, is a right. standard and, tower. And the equipment in it is relatively standard. Yes, this, this equipment. All of which I presume, I don't know where it covers under URL or some other, uh, under, you know, other 
auspices of some other group. But normally the safety issues and all of that are normally covered quite stringently by, by most of the equipment, as long as it's, in, as long as it's correctly installed. Correct. If we're asking a board like this or a Karen like this to understand the techni technicalities of something which is, in actual fact, passed by groups of experts. So as long as we, in my estimation, as long as you have the um, uh, assurance that it will be constructed to within what's already been licensed by some, you know, for emissions of uh, things like uh, microwaving for uh, those sort of uh, electrical disturbances, etc., etc. As long as they're covered in this design, I don't see that a problem. But we're not reviewing that. That's, well, you, that's we the problem. We, 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 we don't have the technical skills to do that. But it's already been reviewed if we had the boards that have already reviewed it, like the underwriters normally for a piece of equipment that doesn't generate uh, interference and that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe not. We haven't, we have not asked for certification that that approval well, has been done. Well, maybe we should do. I, I suspect we should not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I understand your point because I, I thought what we were passing on was the installation of a fairly small concrete pad. We and are. We install some equipment which will support keeping the antenna attack but the power. The, so the, the, I, I appreciate your point on the umpteen pages of detail, but our focus is on a concrete pad, I think, and it's very. Exactly, but that's not what these plans might indicate to someone taking a look at them. That's, and that's exactly what I want to say, that the only thing we're approving, the only thing we have reviewed oh, is the concrete pad and, that's a, and the, the location of a propane tank. How about, uh, Elaine, like on um, finding of facts? Have you read the number one item? Okay, great. The f number one, finding of facts, would some of that or what Maureen has written cover what you're trying to say? that? The, that's what the fine. Okay, the applicant has submitted substantial information beyond the scope of site plan review. Any action by the planning board is limited to the information on the plans related to the site plan review. That, that's that's the idea. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. It seems like they could really submit this whole project on one sheet quite easily. Just the site plan with a block for us to sign. And Yes. I suggested that to the applicant, but I, I think what you're seeing, my sense is, is that the FAA has let out a contract to a private company to get approval for sites across the country, including, if you'll refer back to the workshop, Alaska, and what you're getting is a standard package. Sure. And even though they were strongly urged to weed this down to three pages, um, we got the standard package because my sense is it was just easier to do the standard package than actually weed it down to three pages. I, I get a sense Justin agrees with that statement. Yeah, I, if, if, if it's all right if I speak. Um, I, we really aren't asking you guys to, to rule on the construction drawings. I mean, those are, number one, they're, they're detailed. Number two, they're generic. So um, there's parts on here that won't fit for this site. They, cookie cutter this stuff and that's what they do um, the narrative states what we're looking for I, I apologize that they couldn't give you just the one page with the slab um, really that is all you need I mean I could have hand drawn it and made it a lot clearer that's why I went out and took the time to take those pictures so you guys could actually see what was there and I had them send me pictures of an existing site so you could see what it looks like rather than getting all the technical jargon um, but we aren't asking anybody to be approving these things. There's, I mean, the antenna licensing comes direct from FCC, and in this instance, it's even bigger than that because it has to do with the FAA. So that stuff is taken care of federally. Um, basically, Excellus is leasing this equipment to the FAA, and the FAA is allowing Excellus to run the frequencies that they deem necessary on their equipment. So it's it's a little different. Usually somebody would apply for frequencies so I could give you like the applicant's FCC licensing and in this instance all I have is a piece of paper that says the government says it's okay to use these frequencies. Is there a uh, mylar of the original approval floating around? 
I mean, I imagine the original. But there is a site plan of an original approval in the public files, and that site plan has been amended once already to add equipment for another antenna. But could Justin take a copy of that and just draft that? That was suggested to the applicant, and okay. this is what was submitted. And I'm not the applicant, I'm just the. Yeah, you, you, you are the applicant. <laughs> I know, I know. I didn't get to choose what to apply, though. <laughs> I think the applicant is suggesting that it would cost him a lot more money and effort to do what you're asking him to do. Is the board okay with um, in putting an additional finding of facts that yes. Elaine has suggested and then yeah. moving forward with that? I, I do have a question. Yes. What I don't have a good feel for, I know you're co-locating the propane tanks, but pick a page. Tell me where they are. <laughs> on, oh, on the pages? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if C2 works for you or C1.1, whichever one. Just C6? C1. C1 is if you, probably the best overall site. Okay. This, is, this is the page down here. Through the middle, the, the darker areas is really the location of the tower we're talking yeah. about. And you can tell it's the tower because it has the three lines that say guy on them. So yeah, that's the tower. It's tiny. So. Yeah, it is tiny, but you can see immediately south of that, it says a proposed 120 gallon propane tank. And there's an existing tank. Yeah. And then if you go to another page, it'll give you a much bigger detail of that. But this is, which just shows this the, is the larger oh, detail here. Which just shows the proposed tank. Correct. The, and, the, and the path so that it will go page. on. Right. So C2 1 gives you a little more information. Okay. And C6. I kept looking and looking. <laughs> and they, those are not fenced in any way. No. Elaine? Maureen, would it be appropriate here to add a condition like we did to the prior one, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been revised, as we're going to discuss? Absolutely, it would be appropriate. It would be consistent. Um, Unfortunately, this applicant has struggled with preparing the most basic plans. And I hope you don't take that. No, and I, and I think that this all looms around the government. I, I mean, this is less detailed than, than they're going to give the final construction drawings because the person that gets this will get details on how to install the bolts. I, I mean, it's, we're dealing with a government entity and they want to see this in their permit. And I really, I don't have a lot of control over it. If I was doing this for um, a regular customer, we could deal with a lot less fluff. But um, I mean, I can talk to them. Uh, you know, you can basically we could single out one page of this if you wanted to. I mean, that seems like the most logical. I'm looking at this page here. This shows the dimensions, shows the location of the propane tank. It shows the existing tower. Um, I don't know, you know, if you wanted to pull out a few pages from this, and we essentially say you aren't uh, you aren't dealing with anything based on the other pages. So you no, I'm I'm suggesting something a lot more simple, and that would be, I mean, to me, we 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 we, we will make a finding limiting what we're reviewing, and the only other change I think we're requesting is that we have something so that for the town records, it clearly ties this set of plans to what's already in the town record. And as far as I'm concerned, some, you or someone else could prepare a new cover sheet that simply said what this is. Okay. Amendment to site plan dated titled X prepared by whoever under the following date as previously amended by a plan with the following name on the following date. And that that could either be a change to the first page we have here, or if that's impossible to get, simply attached on top of the first page here and appropriately acknowledged by whoever is certifying this. See, this comes from the Commonwealth of Virginia, and maybe we don't, I don't know if we need to go back to them in order to make it officially part of this packet of plans. Maureen. I certainly understand where you're coming from. And I think 
we need to, if you, to accomplish what you're suggesting, the applicant would have to, at their own expense, retain Sebago Technics and amend the original plan to show the information that's provided. And this applicant is placing the burden for, for preparing plans on the client. And this client isn't going to do that. It would, be, it would be up to this applicant, the property owner, to make that plan. And think, they couldn't just tack a cover sheet on this? I've spoken to the people who've made these plans, and what you're asking for is what I've already asked them for, and this is what we got. But if they're, it just seems to me if they're coming to the town asking us for a building permit, that it is not unreasonable in any way for us to require something as minor as that from them before we extend a building permit. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just so I guess I, saying, despite the fact that it's a little, these people to do it is it's not the way to do it. You're gonna I don't care who does it as yeah. long as it's done before the town is asked to issue a building permit because if we don't ask for it in that context it's not going to happen. That's right. mm -hmm. Any I comments? I'm though, what we're trying to achieve here. We have a de minimis amendment to an existing situation which is essentially a concrete pad and where is the lack of clarity and what we want to have permission to do I just think it's important that we're, that the town is able, this is a project that has had, this will be the second amendment to the project. We've already heard from the applicant that it is likely, in fact, perhaps even desired in the future that there will be even further enhancement of this site. So there may be a third amendment and a fourth amendment and a fifth amendment. And it is so easy to lose track of what has happened if, the, if each document doesn't properly reference what's happened before and you you can't then come and put together the entire complete site plan so the town loses track of what's put, been approved. Can't we put that detail in our resolution approving the application? Making reference to plan, book and page, um, you know, plan, book and page, um, you know, and this is the third. We could, but I have a, I, I think that when somebody's actually out on the site working, what they're going to have in front of them is this and not the other part, the, the plan and not the other part of the record. And it's, it's, it's a very messy procedure, and I don't see any reason why the town should have the burden of accepting something this messy for a project that has this level of technical support and obvious technical capability. Why should we put up with that? Why shouldn't we ask this extremely simple way that allows the town to have proper documentation of what we're being asked to do? I think it's completely reasonable. But, but we simply couldn't use simply put, a couple of measurements from the existing concrete base so much in that direction, so much, very much like a surveyor does when they refer to something. They say five feet in this direction from such and such a pit. Now would describe your pad. I mean, it's nothing to a pad. You just have to put a few dimensions and say that's an amendment, and we could then okay it. It's, it's very, very simple. It doesn't have to be a drawing. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't even have to be the scale. I would imagine just the correct dimensions. You want to put a pad this way, located so many feet from this in this direction. I, mean, I, I guess a simple. Uh, well, one one thing to um, to deal with all of this is that. There were some issues when we when we met with you guys um, before we talked about doing a um, essentially like a building envelope for the tower sites, and I, I, now I can see Maureen's reason for doing this. But I'm going to be coming back to do the building envelope, um, and that will address all the issues that you have, I believe, Lane. Um, it's I'm trying to deal with a government entity who's trying to deal with probably, I'm probably like the seventh tier down on a, on a scale to, to get these drawings. Um, I really... Is this, isn't the location of the concrete pad established already? Yes. So that wouldn't vary. If you, if you noted it, 
simply by saying so many feet, so many inches, etc., etc., in such a direction, if that's already cut, forgive me, cast in concrete, then what's the difference? But I guess I guess my confusion is, is that I have the drawing within this. It's within this packet. So my my question is: Are you concerned? Is that the scale? I, I, yeah. I'm sorry to keep No, no, it is. That's the scale. That's why I'm. That's why I'm saying that if if you if you were worried about approving based on all this information that you don't understand, if we were to pull the page that showed the dimensional, I mean, I don't see that as any different than me drawing it up. This is much more professional to have in the record rather than something drawn up. I think it meets the criteria that you've just been talking about. You mentioned that you put the appropriate north south on there and the dimension. Well, they, they can't change that sheet of that type But you of can place. take a copy of the sheet and, and put that separately. Well, you, you've got an engineer seal on that page, but you can go to the yeah. later. So would you like me to basically do a rough drawing with some scale on it that copies this? I, I mean, I'm, I'm just confused. I, I, I thought you'd rather have something that was, that was drafted rather than have something rough. Um, and, you know, I understand where you're coming from it, to some point, but I think, uh, I think there's some confusion. We're not asking you to, to approve these construction drawings. We just provided the construction drawings because they handled the, the dimensional issues, you know, for the slab. And yeah, I'm I was worried about breaking them out. And I'm trying to figure out the simplest way to do yeah, this. I think there's two issues here. One issue is the surplus of information that's been provided. And I believe fi finding a fact on a motion could handle that part. But I think the second issue is the issue that Elaine has brought up, is that this is an oft amended site plan. Mm -hmm. It's been amended. I think this is the third or fourth amendment. And the board has serious concerns about the ability of the code officer to be able to take a, a set of plans and enforce the site plan with confidence that he'll be able to interpret what was the board's intent. Mm -hmm. For that reason, it's nice to have the original plan, yep. and then you amend that original plan. And every amendment refers back to the original plan. So there's no potential for uh, conflicts as the plan evolves. And this is a brand new set of plans that has no relationship to the original set of plans. It, doesn't look like the original set of plans. There's no reference to the information that was used to create it, and that's creating concerns. Mm -hmm. so. I also think we can, I think Henry has a really interesting idea. We could have done this really differently. I don't think we can do it really differently and do it tonight, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that you want to do it tonight, and from my perspective, you have more than enough information here to do it tonight. I just want to clarify what it is we're doing so I think we can give you your approval tonight mm -hmm. in, in what I'm thinking about. The only thing that can't happen is you can't actually come or your contractors can't come and pull the building permit until somehow they figure out a way to prepare a cover sheet and bring it to the town so the town can look at a cover sheet and connect this amendment to what it is that's being amendment amended. It's a pretty simple thing for them to do mm -hmm. since they're going to have to, someone, maybe you on their behalf, is going to have to come to the town anyway before the actual work is done. So to me, it's, it's a way to give you the ability to move forward, but give the town the accountability that they want. And it's, it's really a very simple thing that we're asking. Okay, so you're not asking me to resubmit plans. You're just asking me no. to reference what's already in existence. Exactly. So basically, I can come into the town and look at the public record and reference the drawings. Because otherwise, yes. I have to pay somebody to give me new drawings. And that's what I, <laughs> we're trying to avoid, because this was already a, a huge expense to get these drawings. All the, all the, the only thing I would say is that these drawings have been stamped by someone else. So if you write on someone else's drawings, I'm not sure it's quite that simple. You'd probably have to send it to them and say, gee, the town has said I have to put these references. These are the references. Can you stamp this amendment? And as long as you know, we have their stamp on your yep. references, then I think we're all set. 
Okay. And I think Maureen can tell you very directly exactly what needs to be there. Is there a recorded plan with the original plan in the first two amendments? We do not record site plans. At all? No. But th there would be one in the file, right? There's multiple ones in the file. So one of those could be taken and re-rendered by its the engineering firm it, it? What I'm hearing from Elaine is not even that you would need to re-render it, it's that you would need to create a reference, an index sheet. You know, on this date, this was approved. On this date, this was approved. These are the sources of the information. So it's it's a written sheet rather than um, a redrawing. So Correct. Okay. That could just go along to the, the applicants. No, that's the difference. It would be a, it would become a sheet. Well, I don't know. If, ideally, there would be enough space to add it down in the lower block of this sheet. But if there have been enough amendments, it might have to be stapled on as a separate sheet, but it would be not part of the narrative approval, but part of the plans itself, like there are several other narrative pages on this plan, general notes pages and, and all the rest. But this would go on, on at the very beginning to tie this in to all the other pro approvals and whatever conditions may have been on the prior site plans. All of those need to still apply, but there, there are no way referenced here. I don't think it, 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 with with the appropriate caveats. I think we can that's we can go with this paper. It's just a surface of information. It sounds like it's doable. I just is it on your end? Mm -hmm. have to pull teeth out for people that that don't understand simplicity. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then at this point, really, um, we also were going to talk about would anyone like a site walk before we make any further motions? So at this point, I want to bring up the site walk. Would anyone like to take a site walk before we move any further on this item? No. Okay, I'll start on the site walk. Okay. Then, excuse me. Then, would anyone like to make a motion on this? Elaine. I will. <laughs> Findings of fact. Justin Strout, representing the Strout family, is requesting an amendment to the previously approved site plan to add an equipment cabinet, generator, and fuel cylinder to the area at the base of an existing tower located on Strout Road, which requires site plan review under section 19-9. Two, the project will be served by electric power. Three, the applicant has submitted substantial information beyond the scope of site plan review. Any action by the planning board is limited to the information on the plans directly related to site plan review. Be it ordered, oh, three, the application substantially complies with section 19.9 site plan regulations. Four. Yeah, number oh, four, that's four. Okay, then those are the findings. Now be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application of Justin Strout, representing the Strout family, for an amendment to the previously approved site plan to add an equipment, gener ca equipment cabinet, generator, and fuel cylinder to the area at the base of an existing tower located on Strout Road be approved subject to the following conditions. One, that the applicant provide a letter from Central Maine Power confirming an adequate supply of electricity to serve the project. Two, that a title block or index sheet be added as the first sheet of the amended site plan, referencing the name and date of the original site plan approval and any amendments to that original site plan. Town staff shall review the identification information to confirm the references to existing site plans and any prior amendments. Three, that there be no issuance of a building permit nor alteration of the site until the plans have been rev rev so revised. Do we sign site plans? Um, and approved by town staff. Motion by Elaine. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? 
I actually, um, on the finding of facts, the applicant has submitted information that complies with the request for financial capability. I'm not sure if that should be added because in here it says he had not. Uh, I don't know. You can, yeah, but it's more a uh, piece of completeness, and you had already made a motion on completeness, so if uh, you want to okay. just omit it, you, do, you can. Okay, then we'll omit that then. Anyone else a motion uh, made, uh, excuse me, discussion on the motion? No? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor? All those opposed? And that was unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Motion has passed. Next item on our agenda is building permit notification zoning amendment. The town council has referred to the planning board a proposed amendment to the zoning ordinance that would require that a public notice be mailed when some building permits are issued. This is under section 19-10-3, amendments to the zoning ordinance, and it is scheduled for a public hearing. This item will be addressed as follows. The town planner will provide a summary of the item, followed by any public comment. Then the board may discuss this item, followed by a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, a summary on this item, please. Sure. Um, this amendment was brought forward uh, by the Ordinance Committee with support of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the Zoning Board has entertained, I believe, since October, um, at least two appeals that they were unable to uh, decide on the merits of the appeal because the appeal was filed more than 30 days after a building permit had been issued. And the concern was that people aren't finding out about the building permits in a timely enough manner to be able to uh, initiate an appeal if they choose to. So uh, there was an effort here to balance the need to expand the public's knowledge of government actions and at the same time to not unduly burden government uh, actions with noticing when we may want our code enforcement officer to really spend more time doing enforcement and inspection in the field. So what this does is it creates a notice requirement for building permit issuance. And the notice requirement has nothing to do with whether or not you can get a building permit. That still is exactly the same way it's handled now, the same setbacks, the same procedures. But once a building permit is issued, if it's within 100, if the activity that the permit is issued for is located within 125 feet of the normal high water line of coastal waters, or if it's located within 10 feet of a setback, then it would trigger a notice that would be mailed to everyone within 50 feet of the property where the building permit is being issued for. So you would be getting a notice approximately 20 days before the deadline would be for appealing that building permit. Any questions? The, the one other thing I should mention is we, we were just trying to get a handle on how much additional work this would be. Um, I did a, a very brief review of last year's building permits, and we're estimating about 65 to 75 permits that would generate notices. Okay. This is an item for um, open for public comment at this time. If anyone would like to comment on the building permit notification amendment, please come forward. Please state your name and your address. George Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. I had a question. I think I heard you say 125 feet of the high water? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, along the ocean, the zone is 250 feet. I think I got that right, 250 feet? Yeah. So why wouldn't this be 250 feet? Because that's in the protected zone. Why would we be creating yet a third zone? We have 75 feet and 250. Now you're going to create a third zone for building permit at 125 feet. Why wouldn't we stay with the 250 foot? Okay. 
okay. it makes it simpler. If anything's happening in the protected zone, you notify the abutters. Maureen, should I answer the questions after or during their three well, minutes? Well, it's up to you, but I, I mean, I've been at meetings where the give and take can get out of hand. What I would suggest is that we know all of the questions that have been asked, and then after the public hearing is over, we can answer those questions. Okay, okay. I'm gonna That's fine. stick I just, to that. So I have that question down. Thank you. And oh, and uh, you said you, you'd notify anybody within 50 feet of that lot? Mm-hmm. I think perhaps more people than that would be interested. Um, I don't know if we can get it a wider notification so that more than just the direct neighbors, I mean, that's, that's only the abutting lots. So um, it affects quite a few of the neighbors. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to address this item? Hi, my name is Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. And I just wanted to say that I support um, building permit notification. Um, I think the um, zoning workshop folks did a great job, and um, we were invited, a few of us were invited to go upstairs to Maureen's office and look at the GIS system, mapping system, and we actually could plug in, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, and keep going and see how many people would be notified. We, when we did it, I felt that 60 feet worked better, particularly um, I used um, something on Surf Avenue and in my neighborhood on Pilot Point Road. On Pilot Point Road, if we did 60 feet, it got myself, like if someone across the street was doing something, I was notified and the people beside me were notified. With 50 feet, um, I think only one of the people was notified, and it's because they owned a piece of land close to it. Otherwise, I think it would have just been myself and, and the people just on either side. So I would vote for a consideration to look at 60 feet um, as the perimeter rather than 50. But otherwise, I'm very, very supportive of it. I think it would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, my name is Baird Mallory. I live at 40 Surf Road. Uh, I'm just curious as to why um, this has to do with waterfront specifically and not neighbors. It seems to me if the um, intent is to say that any neighbors should be notified so they have a chance to say things, why have you um, selected only those people uh, close to the water. Okay, we'll be answering all the questions at the end. Did, any further comments or questions other than that? That's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Would anyone else like to step forward and talk about this item? Seeing none, I am going to close the public hearing at this point. And we did have a couple of questions. So uh, first one was um, why 125 feet versus the 250 feet that is mentioned in some of the uh, zoning ordinance. Ma Maureen, can you address that one? Certainly. And um, the current code officer, Ben McDougall, was um, a resource to the ordinance committee and was asked for his input on how this would work. He previously worked for the town of York and they have a notification requirement and they, um, the trigger is 125 feet, within 125 feet of the water. And he said that's because that seems to be where there's the most controversy regarding building permits. So um, I would suggest that 125, 125 feet is a number that's used by another community. Uh, it is true that the Shoreland Zone Overlay District is a 250-foot wide district. Certainly, you could substitute 250 for 125. That's, that's up to you. Um, the notification of within 50 feet, uh, the, again, the, the Ordinance Committee discussed that, and I think they were really trying to balance 
um, their desire to notify people, but really to focus the efforts of town staff and town resources where it would do the most good. So is there a magic between 50 feet or 60 feet or 100 feet? It's just the numbers go up. Um, the more notices we send out, the more time we're going to be spending on doing that. And I don't think anyone's complaining about spending time doing that. I really don't want that to be the message. But the point is, there's eight hours in a day, and how do you want those eight hours spent? So we can spend that time sending out notices, or we can spend that time doing more enforcement. It's, it's really trying to balance. So I'm happy to answer any of that question. Um, and then there was a question about why is it waterfront and not neighbors. And again, the thought was that it seems that the most, the, the most feedback, the most controversy on building permits seem to be building permits issued to people who have waterfront lots. Nevertheless, we also have this requirement that any structure that's within 10 feet of a setback line would also trigger a notice. And the Ordinance Committee actually went at length trying to build exceptions. And where we went very quickly was, um, and actually Joe was extremely helpful in explaining to us how difficult it is for two people to calculate volume and both of them to get the same number. Because um, we were trying to calculate if you were making an expansion above a certain volume or if you were going above a certain size, then that would trigger a notice. And it came down to we would spend a lot of time in the office trying to calculate when projects would trigger a notice. So we tried to keep it really simple. Anything that's within 10 feet of the setback line triggers a notice. Elaine. So if I'm understanding your property, there's a band within the shoreland zone that is not covered by this requirement. Correct. The first 100 feet, roughly. It's 250 and this the, is it's one the first half. And the Shoreland Zone is, think of it as a regulatory area. Right. And you're not allowed to build within the first 75 feet. So there's different numbers in the Shoreland Zone that you have to comply with. So you can build 76 feet away from the water um, and you would trigger a notice. You could build 200 feet away from the water and you would not trigger a notice, but you would still be regulated by the shoreland zone. So that was going to be my question. If a building permit had been issued for something that is not covered within the shoreland zone, right. but the portion of it not covered by this particular provision, mm -hmm. what other approvals and other notices might all would already have been sent because we're within the sort of shoreland zone or if not necessarily any? None, because if if you well the other exemption that I did mention here is if something has to go to the planning board of the zoning board you also don't have to send a notice when the building permit goes out because notices have already gone out as part of those other review procedures uh, but yes if you're if you're in the shoreland zone and you're building 150 feet away and you are more than 10 feet away from any setback line you would not trigger a notice to your neighbors Okay. Anyone else like to weigh in on some of the numbers we're hearing or some of the information? It, it seems to me that excuse me, there is a, and I think as Marina said, a balancing act going on here. And we're moving from situations where no notices are required to places where past controversies have erupted. And we think it would be appropriate to try to cover them by notice. There's no magic to a 50 or 60 or 80 feet, as the lady said, uh, at 60 feet, some people were picked up. But anecdotally, on any property arrangement, 50 or 75 or 100 might do just fine, or it might miss important pieces. So I think we're trying to just try, trying to have broad coverage here on areas where there has been a problem. And the building inspector seems to be, uh, the code enforcement officer, excuse me, seems to be uh, convinced that these these numbers are appropriate for that purpose. Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't the shore area because of blocking of view and stuff like that, and that trigger that area building within, within close to the water and the people close to you can't see what they've seen before because you're blocking it? Typically, that's probably one of the reasons it becomes more sensitive, but it, it needs to be made very clear that the, the sending of a notice in and of itself 
is not a prohibition against blocking a view. Correct. Any other comments on some of the it, public comments? Is yes, not Senator. another way of doing it other than having to send out individual notices that is covered by a lot of people? I mean, by publication or something. I know you put it up on the notice board and nobody will read it. But well, yes, and that, that is that was raised as, you know, can't we just post it on the website? And the, uh, the ordinance committee discussed that at length. And the thought was that, are you checking the website every month on the off chance that one of your neighbors may be getting a building permit? And the answer is no, most people don't do that. And therefore, even though we're posting it on the website, it doesn't address the fundamental concern that um, the town, the code enforcement office, and in particular the zoning board had, that um, people were not finding out about these in sufficient time to be able to ask questions. So they want about posting it on the site. I mean, you know, the hats is for sale, they know what is for sale sign. Another good question, and that was also discussed by the ordinance committee, um, but there were some concerns about that as well. For example, um, you have to make it a weatherproof sign, and you need to guarantee that it's there and it hasn't been removed by someone. And so it seemed that the simplest way to go would be to churn out these notices. Um, I actually picked a random lot, um, ran through the notice procedure, and it takes about 45 minutes to generate the labels, write the notice, to the six to ten people who are going to receive a notice. And then maybe miss the one that really want to object. But you're getting all the abutters. Well, the abutters is one thing, but there are people who are close neighbors who might not hit it. And it's not a question of getting people who object. I think it's a question of making sure that the public has an opportunity to scrutinize the decision that the town has made to issue the permit. Yes, that's So in the interest of transparency, people can't scrutinize what the town is doing if they don't find out about it in time to, grant, to, to review an appeal. But those other items were reviewed. Any other comments, questions? I, I also do see this as a balancing act. I'm looking 45 minutes just to send out five or six notices. Um, the 50 feet does catch the abutters. That is who will be notified. Um, this is something that is new and this will go on to the council. There's no, I did try to do a search to see if any other local community was doing anything like this and they're not. Um, so this Portland is, does. Portland sends well, out one? I, I get notification of, of changes within a large area of my building in Portland, yes. Okay. It's like zoning changes. Um, I don't read them well enough for that. They don't seem to correct me now. They're, they're, they're zoning changes. No. Uh, my very unscientific came up with none. Um, this is the first time we're trying to do this. It is a balancing act. Um, I can understand why we are doing this, so I do support that we are trying to notify people, make it more public. Um, I know it's difficult to come up with that number. Once again, the 50 only does catch the abutters. This will go on to the council. They certainly can also look at those numbers again, but um, I am comfortable with at least initially rolling this out um, and I'm sure the council will say this might be something that we can also review because there have been other um, new items that we have brought out and they said after maybe a year we can review it see if it's how it's working make any changes but I am willing to let's send this forward and I'm unless I'm hearing anything else from anyone else um, I would like to take a motion at this time then. Can I ask Maureen a Certainly. question? How often does it happen that a building permit is challenged at the zoning board and revoked? I, that's a good question and to be honest, I don't monitor the zoning board activities. I can tell you that one of the reasons this is before the town is because the town currently has three lawsuits uh, pending regarding building permit issuance. And the intent was if those, if those people had found out about the building permit in sufficient time to take it to the zoning board, we might mitigate some of that controversy. Um, 
we have had one of those lawsuits remanded back to the zoning board for consideration. So I don't know whether you call that a flaw in the building permit or not yet. Is there anyone else? Would anyone like to make a motion at this time? Yes, please, Pete. A motion for the board to consider be it ordered that the proposed building permit notification zoning amendment be recommended to the town council for consideration. Do I have a second? Second. Second, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? And this motion does pass and will be going on to the council. Next meeting. Just speak. Yes. For people who are following this, what I expect this to ha hap what I expect to happen is this would be on the August town council agenda, and they could either at the August meeting refer it back to the ordinance committee, or they could refer it to a public hearing in September. So just to keep track of the schedule. Um, one question. Go ahead. As written. No. Thank you. Okay. Then the next item on the agenda is the normal high water line definition zoning amendment. The town council has referred to the planning board a proposed amendment to replace the current normal high water line definition with the standard state definition. This is under section 19-10-3 amendments to the zoning ordinance public hearing. Uh, there will be an introduction by the town planner and then followed by any public comment and then a discussion by the board. Maureen, a summary on this one, please. Sure. So um, another amendment to the zoning ordinance, and this one regards the definition of the normal high water line. And the normal high water line definition is important because that is the point from which you measure 250 feet upland to determine what area is in the shoreland zone. So. Uh, when the town adopts shoreland zoning, we are required to submit our zoning to the, to the state, and they decide whether our, state, our town's shoreland zoning meets the state minimums for shoreland zoning. We have a definition for normal high water line right now, which is unique to, it's, it's unique to Cape Elizabeth. It's not the standard definition that the state provides us with. And they have accepted that definition. However, the current code officer, Ben McDougall, is recommending that we replace our current definition with the standard state definition. His main reason for that is that he is concerned that the current definition is vague, and it requires him to make a case-by-case -case determination with insufficient specificity in the current definition. So for that reason, he's recommending we go with the state definition. He feels that, that, that we would be able to benefit from technical support from the state they have had to test their definition. They have experience throughout the state in applying the definition to specific situations. Um, and he feels that it would be more predictable. So for that reason, what you have before you is, in short answer, um, a, a, a replacement of our current definition with the state definition. And what that would do is it would replace our normal high water line of coastal waters definition with a, with a normal high water line definition, and then we would also add a coastal wetland definition that supports one piece of the normal high water line definition. So, unless you need more description, I'll stop there. Everyone else said on that? This one is also open for public comment. Would anyone like to approach the podium and speak on this item? Uh, Baird Mallory again, 40 Surf. Strongly endorse uh, as uh, a layperson trying to make heads and tails, uh, having gone through um, the documents that describe our policy, it's really hard to figure out. <laughs> to the, and I've understood that apparently when it was created in the 80s, it was then changed subsequently and subsequent to that. So it's been a moving target that um, is, is hard for people to discern. So if I, I don't know what the state's definition is, but if it's clearer and more easily understood, um, as a member of the community, I would strongly support it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
George Foley, um, can you tell me if this will increase or decrease our um, restricted area? And I'll answer that question at the end after I've taken all questions. Let's Makes it very difficult to talk. Oh, yes, that's right, your address. You? Oh, that's George right. Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. Thank you. Oh, uh, go ahead. The goal of this is to protect the shoreland and our oceans. And right now we have a actually fairly clear definition, which I believe is the top of the bank. It's not too hard to say, here's the top of the bank, it drops off to the ocean. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we've had people come in trying to use a different definition, for instance, the seasonal high water. And the state requires that you use, I think it was an 11 and a half foot tide or a 12 foot tide. The applicant presented a seven and a half foot tide and basically blew right through the hearings using that. It's going to be very complex as you use the state definition because there are actually three criteria that someone else will speak to. But you'll have to come in supporting each of the three criteria because this, we could probably turn off cell phones. <laughs> um, the state, you'd have to come in with each of those three criteria because part of the rule says that the most restrictive must apply. So you'd have to substantiate each of those three methods. The applicant would have to hire experts in those areas and then You'd have to determine which was the most restrictive, and that's where your top of the bank would be, or your edge of the wetlands. Okay? That would start your 75-foot line. Then you'd also have this new one that you're talking about, the 125-foot line. I believe the 250-foot line is set by map, so that probably wouldn't change. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Richard Bryant. I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and I'd just like to make a couple of quick points about the proposed change. I think the biggest um, effect of this change in the ordinance as proposed would be that with respect to rocky ledges along the shoreline, this substitutes essentially a mathematical still water line determined by a surveyor as to where the highest tide is or the tide tables um, for a line which our current ordinance uh, locates based upon the geography of the particular site and how it is affected by the tides. So at least with that aspect of Cape Shoreland, which involves rocky ledges, this will be a significant erosion of the protection that's provided by our current shoreland zoning ordinance. On the face of it, you might not be shrinking the shoreland zoning ordinance or, or affecting the uh, standards of rebuilding in the shoreland ordinance, but by changing this definition, that's the effect that you're going to have. Um, to give a concrete example of that, I think the most famous example of the current use of the top of the bank or extreme limit of the tides uh, uh, ordinance is with Trundy Point. When that property was owned by the Mack family, they attempted to, development, to develop it. The town turned down their application to develop that property, uh, and they cited the code enforcement officer's determination of the top of the bank, which was as you look at it on a map and go out and tour Trendy Point now, is indeed the top of, uh, of the bank where the uh, exposed ledge starts converting over to sparse vegetation and perhaps some soils. Um, if the proposed change that the code enforcement officer now has in front of you is adopted by the town, Trundy, if that were in place at the time the Macs were attempting to develop Tr Trundy Point, we would be sitting with, here with houses on Trundy Point today because the, the mathematical uh, high water mark uh, determined according to the current standards as proposed uh, would be, I don't know, 40, 50 feet further down uh, the shore from where the top of the bank is. Uh, 
as determined by the town at that time. I'd also say that the state wetland definitions, um, uh, as has been pointed out, not only relies on three separate criteria for determining where the top of the bank is, to my mind, it, there is a, a big gap in that ordinance or that proposed definition by the state because it doesn't specifically deal with rocky ledges and cliffs. Um, it talks about three things. One, title and subtitle lands, which again, your surveyor can tell you where the maximum high tide line is or the mean high water mark or whatever other mathematical standard you want to locate on, on the face of the, of the ground. Um, that's obviously lower than the top of the bank with respect to Trundy Point near the rocky ledges in, in Cape. The second criteria at the state level is all lands with uh, vegetation tolerant of salt water. I'm paraphrasing and condensing, but when you have an, uh, an eroded, uh, exposed rocky ledge, there's no soil there on the ledge itself to uh, sustain salt tolerant vegetation, so immediately on rocky ledges, I think you have to go back to the mathematical still water line of the highest tide. And then the third criteria by the state talks about swamps, marshes, bogs, beaches, flatlands, or other contiguous lowlands subject to tidal action. And again, it doesn't, in that definition, suggest anything about rocky ledges. And I'm not sure that when one looks at a rocky ledge like on Trundy Point or other parts of Cape Shorelands, that you're going to be able to say, yes, that's a contiguous lowland that we should treat just like a marsh. Uh, so I think that there are some real problems with the state's definitions. Um, as for the point as to whether the state's definition is any more understandable than the current top of the bank, extreme limit of the tide standard the town has been using, I'd say the state's definition is harder to comprehend than the current uh, town ordinance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think it is true that if you're going to start using the proposed state definition, that every application that comes before you is not only going to have to look at those three criteria, but every application that comes before you is going to have to have a surveyor out determining where that mathematical still water line of the highest tide is along the, along the shore. I think that's both not intuitively understandable to the layman, and I think it's impractical for many purposes. Um, administrative efficiency might be helped because our code enforcement officer will, will, also, will be looking at a survey line on every application that comes in, um, but that's not the reason for our ordinance. Our, the reason for our ordinances are to protect uh, um, the properties in Cape, and for the shoreland zone in particular, uh, it's intended to protect the, re the natural resources we have there. So I don't think that the argument that uh, our code enforcement officer finds would find it less ambiguous to be pointed out a surveyor's line uh, is a good enough reason to make a, a change to the ordinance that's going to gut the protective uh, purpose behind the shoreland zoning ordinance. And unless you, at the same time, increase the setbacks on the shoreland zone with respect to where the uh, the normal high water line is for coastal waters, I think the inevitable result of this proposed change is to lessen the protections that the town has put in place. But one last point I put in uh, uh, is that I understand the code enforcement officer's motivation for proposing this change, um, but I think that the confusion he cites and the recent lawsuits that have uh, that have been generated by decisions of the town with respect to building permits in the shoreland zone. My own view, and I have some involvement in those cases, so at least some of those cases, so I, I, I may be biased in that regard. My own view is that the confusion arose not from ambiguity in our ordinance. I think the confusion arose because the standard of top of the bank, which was easily understandable and used by this town and upheld by the courts, including the law court, for decades and decades, was in recent years by the former code enforcement officer applied differently. I think he chose no longer to use the top of the bank, which everybody knew and understood, and instead was issuing permits based upon some other lesser standard. Um, and that, I think, was the difficulty that led to the lawsuits, to at least some of the lawsuits that were involved in challenges of building permits in the shoreland zone. And if there's anything else, that the board would like to ask me, I'm happy to answer questions. Otherwise, I, I'll sit down. I think we're all set at this point. Thank, Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, 
Deborah Murphy, 24 Pilot Point. Um, I've lived there for 15 years. And much of what Nick Bryant said, I, uh, all of it I agree with. And to give you a specific example, um, a property across the street from my home, if the code enforcement officer, and, and my husband and I have met with him and talked about this, and we actually scaled it out, if the state statute were to be applied, the property owner could build 62 feet closer to the ocean, thereby allowing uh, approximately 1,550 feet, square feet additional impervious surface, thereby allowing increased stormwater um, flow into the ocean and to the point that other folks have made, the whole purpose for the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act is to protect the coastal wetlands and other wetlands. Um, and I applaud that Cape Elizabeth chose, and other towns did too, um, chose at the time when the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act came out to create their own language. So they didn't adopt the state statute. Um, and that, that language is fairly old too. These, these statutes have um, been around for a while. I do believe that it would be far more difficult with the research that I've done, um, and I've called the state geologists, um, the experts, supposedly, supposed experts in using HAT, highest annual tide. It, it's a very complex, uh, he, he couldn't even describe it well. Um, but I think I do have an email, and if I can find it, I'll send it to you. It's a very complex process. It's not simple. And as folks have mentioned, and I made a copy of a DEP information sheet that I verified that this still stands. Um, and I'll just read part of it. It's, it's um, DEP LW0618. It's a DEP information sheet, Maine Department of Environmental Protection, establishing the starting point for measurement of the shoreland zone and related setback determinations. And it's dated, issued October 2003. The Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act, Title 38, MRSA, Sections 435 through 449, requires Maine's municipalities to adopt ordinances regulating land use activities within 250 feet horizontal distance of the normal high water line of Great Ponds, Rivers, and Tidal Waters, 250 feet horizontal, horizontal distance of the upland edge of a freshwater or coastal wetland, and 75 feet horizontal horizontal distance of streams as defined in the law. This document is designed to assist parties working with the law and the various municipal shoreland zoning ordinances in determining the edge of the water body or wetland, which is the starting point for measuring the shoreland zoning distances and setback measurements. Please note that this document is based on the minimum requirements as contained in the State of Maine guidelines for municipal shoreland zoning. Municipalities may have adopted more restrictive shoreland zoning ordinances, of which Cape Elizabeth did. If you go to coastal wetlands, and I can, would you like a copy because I made one for you all? Would it be helpful to have it as I read it? Uh, sure, you can pass it out. So if you look on page three, you'll see coastal wetlands. And the very first method is really what CAPE does now. It's a visual method. And that's a recommended method, a first step. So the visual inspection inspection method. This is a common method used to make a determination of the starting point for measuring the shoreland zone of a coastal wetland, but may be less precise than the elevation method. The visible inspection method consists of looking for evidence of shoreland scouring, a tidal debris line, and or the presence of salt tolerant vegetation. When visible evidence is not satisfactory to establish a definitive edge, the elevation method can be used to determine the upland edge of the wetland. Then you go to the elevation method which is what our code enforcement officer is looking at um, right now uh, and not including the, the visual inspection method piece of this. 
Elevation method. Where visible evidence is lacking or is unclear, the method for determining the starting point of the shoreland zone for coastal wetlands is the use of the maximum spring tide levels as identified in the tide tables published by the National Ocean Service. This determination requires surveying, utilizing appropriate adjustments for site-specific elevations. The DEP publishes conversion tables for ease in, det in determining these elevations. There are times when there is little visual evidence of the upland edge of the coastal wetland at a particular location. But at a nearby location, a clear upland edge can be found. In those situations, it is reasonable for the transfer of the elevation from the known site to the site that lacks visual evidence. Note also that where visual evidence, such as the presence of salt-tolerant vegetation, extends further inland than the measured tidal elevation, the line formed by the more restrictive criterion must be used. So the cases that have occurred the past, in the past year, I think, were due to the code, previous code enforcement officer not adhering to top of the bank. I went back and watched all of the videos of the appeals online, and I read all of the appeals as far back as I could go. <laughs> the last one I looked at was 2002. There is not one case other than the MAC versus the town of Cape Elizabeth, um, of which the town of Cape Elizabeth prevailed in using the top of the bank and the extreme effective tides. There is not one appeal in Cape Elizabeth that was caused by adhering to the top of the bank. The appeals in the last year were caused because hat was used. So it's, it's, a, it, it's a very complex way to measure. It's very difficult, um, and I don't support the language change for that reason. Um, and it will make, as I said, a lot across the streets, 62 feet. They can build 62 feet close to the water. With sea levels rising, with everything that's going on, with wetlands being inundated with pollution, we don't have any laws saying that people can't use harmful chemicals on their lawns on the coastline. People do. Um, to allow that much storm additional stormwater runoff, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I think Cape Elizabeth did a great job in being more restrictive, and I think they should continue to be to protect our citizens and the environment and the wetland. Um, and I think that's pretty much what I wanted to... Oh, there is one thing that I think is interesting. So in doing some more research on the town's website, I found the Robinson's Woods 2 acquisition. Um, and it said Town of Cape Elizabeth slash Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. And the legal description of the property on Exhibit A in that document on the town website, which is um, the acquisition of that land, and it was um, sent, uh, put together by Monaghan and Leahy, the town's law firm uh, lawyer, says, um, gives all of the definitions, as someone mentioned earlier in, in a previous um, discussion about um, using a survey and the descriptions to get to certain places. It says, thence westerly along the center pond Cove Brook, 1,351 feet more or less to the northwest of the corner of King's Grant subdivision as surveyed. Thence south, 0, uh, 1 degrees, 43 minutes, 45 seconds west along the westerly line of said King's Grant, 130 feet more or less to the top of the bank. Thence westerly and southwesterly along the top of the said bank. So the top of the bank is used in, in legal description for property. And I also noticed that even in our ordinance and in the York ordinance, where our uh, code enforcement officer came from, he's, and he's a great guy and doing a great job, um, there's language of when you have unstable bluffs, you use top of the bluff. So to me, to see that delineation, it's particularly with rocky ledges, it's really easy to see where the top of the bank is. I mean, there is a definite line, um, and I do feel that the language should stay as is. I, I don't promote 
And I don't think the citizens of Cape Elizabeth would be happy knowing that if this is changed, that people will be able to build closer to the coastal wetland and negatively affect the coastal wetland. And it's anywhere from 62 to 75 feet closer just along my street. So thank you very, very much for allowing me to be heard. I really appreciate it. Anyone else at this time? Then I will be closing the portion of the public hearing, and now I'm turning it to the board. Uh, Maureen, there was a number of questions, though. I know you are more of an expert than I am on this, so if you could answer some of those questions, I'd appreciate it. Okay, so the question was asked, will this increase or decrease the restricted area? And the code enforcement officer has not answered this question, but he has pointed out that this question, where is the normal high water line, is the one he's been asked the most. And his real challenge has been that it's being determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So when you have that case-by-case -case basis, it's that uncertainty. So I can't, I can't answer for you, will this increase or decrease the restricted area? I can send it to the code officer. I'm not sure you'll get an answer from him. Um, I think the answer is yes and no. In some cases it will, in some cases it won't. But that's, that's just a guess on my part. Um, and I think that's the only question I noted. I think that is the only question. There were comments about, um, no more comments. Did you capture any of the comments that? No, um, the comments. Okay, let's see. Um, I can tell you yeah, that the, the current definition we have, the top of bank, is the definition that the town used in the famous, infamous, however you want to put it, Mac case. Uh, I didn't really hear any comments made that um, I, I know of being inaccurate. That was, um, I know that uh, one of my first uh, responsibilities when I was hired by the town was to update the shoreland zoning in, I believe, in 1992. Um, in my ignorance, I used all of the state standard language and was reprimanded for replacing the normal high water line definition that had top of bank with the state standard. So it's been a deliberate decision by the town to retain that top of bank definition. So it, it's, it wasn't an accident. Um, the, the comment I've heard is in a lot of cases, there may not be a brilliant top of bank. You know, if you think about the coastal plain, it tends to do this. So where you, where you don't have a really, you know, bright line, there is some struggle by the code officer to determine where you start looking at the top of the bank. I think where there hasn't been a bright line, some of the, the hat uh, elements have been used, uh, looking at vegetation, looking at staining on the rocks. Um, really yes be nice if Ben was here but. okay um, thank you I'm gonna turn it over to the board any comments any questions Elaine oh sorry Elaine go ahead. oh will you go ahead, go ahead. No, no go ahead I'm sorry and National Ocean Service publisher listed by a party by checks if there's no top of the bank, could we not use that? Isn't that a, uh, isn't, isn't there a substitution for that so that we have an alternative? If uh, for the code enforcement officer, we can't find these things that we can the, use that as a, as a <laughs> The current definition says is the top of the beach bank cliff, cliff block or the extreme high limit of the tides. That's the definition he has right now. That's the definition he legally should be applying. The proposed definition would reference some of the information, the National Ocean Service, other information. That, that, is, that is the problem, that when you, when you use the current definition and it, it doesn't give you enough information in certain circumstances, where does the code officer legally go? So the point my, my thing was, if we use the original one, which we have down here, if there is some uh, 
you can't find where the top is, then you should use, as a secondary method, the National Ocean Service um, publication. And, and I mentioned to the code officer this afternoon that there might be concerns with replacing the definition we had. And his response was, you know, he, he's not going to sweat um, if his recommendation isn't adopted and you don't go with the state definition. But he is going to ask for clarity to be added to the existing definition. So what you're suggesting that, you know, maybe we, we need to have a fallback when the top of the bank beach, cliff, bluff, or the extreme high limit of the tides cannot be determined that you have another, another standard that you can use. Because originally when we were in discussion, I thought that the state definition was the way to go. So listening to, to sort of uh, the comments today, maybe it should be a hybrid <laughs> between us and, and the state. Elaine? Did you have some questions, comments? I guess my comment in some ways was very similar to Henry's, that based on what we had heard, I was thinking that this kind of bright line, measurable line, that was, um, was not something that was subject to a lot of dispute, and we're hearing tonight that actually it is subject to a lot of dispute, that there is no line that you can just sort of draw based on a Google Maps type topography. I don't know if that's true or not. We've heard two different things on that. We've also heard that the impact of what we're doing is to significantly reduce the shoreland protection on rocky ledges. I don't, again, I don't know if that's true or not. That's not what we had, that's not what I had understood from the discussions with the code enforcement officer. So I guess what I'm thinking is, for me, we need to go back to workshop on this and really get more information because the, the bright line, one, isn't a bright line, and two, would um, create, would po possibly create consequences that are not what I at least was intending for us to create. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with Elaine. I think we should workshop it and get Ben back even. Okay. I agree. On the workshopping? Maureen, could you, uh, I'm a little confused, the rocky ledge seems to be a critical point here, and this may sound like a really dumb question, but what is a rocky ledge? Is this something where the, the a rocky cliff extends ab above the, where the water is? Yes, and, and you know, that's one of the, probably one of the most beautiful features of Cape Elizabeth right. is there is such a rocky coastline, and um, because of all the work we've been doing at the Greenbelt Plan, I seem to be spending a lot of time on Surfside Ave. And Surfside Ave, and, and just south of Pilot Point Road, is an excellent example of uh, a situation where you have the ocean, you have uh, rocky ledges, and then you have a sheer cliff. Um, so it, it, in that case, I think it's, well, I, actually, I shouldn't say that because there are outstanding court cases. But there's a sheer cliff, then there's the top of the cliff, and then there's the land where there's soil and things are growing. And the question is, under the current definition, should you be going to the top of the sheer cliff or should you be going halfway down the cliff and potentially on the rocky ledges where you can see staining of the rocks? And, and that's actually a question that's still being adjudicated. But if there's the water in a 90 degree cliff, if you go to the top and start your 250-foot your measurement, that's, that's, think that's, some that's not a problem. But isn't it where there's a, a gradient rocky cliff well, between the top and the water? <laughs> the former code officer didn't always use the top of the cliff. He was down by the ledges. So if the ledge is further away from the cliff, you've got an extra X minus. OK, so that's the rub, really. I think that's, that's one of the challenges. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I have, when I draft um, regulations to comply with state shoreland zoning, I usually have at least one or two conversations with, with the state DEP coordinator, and we talk about the places where the town of Cape Elizabeth is not following the letter of the state standard. And I make an argument that there are special local conditions or that we're being more restricted than the state minimums. And I feel that you know the state's really good at working with us, 
And in the case of this definition, uh, we have the argument I've always made is that the top bank definition is more restrictive than the state's you know, the normal high water line, and they have generally agreed with that. So, I mean, they will they will allow you to adopt something that's below the minimum if you can show special local circumstances. And they will allow you to do something different than the minimum as long as you show that you're basically meeting their standard. And when it came to the normal high water line definition, I have been on record in front of the council in the 1990s and again in 2002 saying that our current normal high water line definition was more restrictive. But I am not the person that interprets it and applies it out in the field. Is there something to be said? Uh, one of the commenters was um, talking about a, was the problem in the code enforcement officer's interpretation rather than the language. And if you think about it, if, if you move from code enforcement officer to code enforcement officer over time, you could be getting fairly significant differences in the outlook. And that's one thing you want to avoid. You really right. want to have ordinance language that has some predictability regardless of who is interpreting it. And I think isn't that part of why Ben wanted to adopt the high tide level because that gives you a number, any surveyor he can go was, out and find that line. I mean, he really wants to interpret the ordinance in a consistent manner. And he is uncomfortable with the lack of specificity in the current definition. Uh, but nevertheless, he, he isn't, um, I don't believe he's trying to set policy. I believe his goal is for a clear standard. But also, if we found that the high tide level uniformly in, uh, brought the 250 foot setback line closer to the ocean, we could change that to 300 feet. You could. There are ways to deal. I mean, and we've, we've talked about um, climate change and um, how to handle storm sur surge, and you've you're, if you use the state definition, it says you, to hit that annual high tide, you could say you want to be a foot above the annual high tide. And that could actually push development more than a foot back. Because if you're, if, you know, if you're at, at high tide 11 and you say you want to be at high tide 12, depending on the elevation, the topography of the land, it could actually push you back five feet, it could push you back 40 feet. Um, so there are ways to do that. You could, you could look at your setbacks that in the shoreland zone. Right now you have a 75 foot setback. That's the state minimum. You could increase that setback. You could make it, make it larger. Um, keep in mind, um, I think politically that would be extremely difficult to do. There's a lot of people that have built to be, to be conforming. And if you moved it back, you would throw a lot of structures into non-conforming status, which dramatically changes what they can do for expansion. So right. I think but our that would be tough. This is not to allow people to build closer to the ocean. I mean, I agree I, with what I don't believe the I don't believe the intent when it was brought forward was to change the policy. It was more to make the ordinance more predictable and less variability case by case. Yeah, this was a process amendment which may have an unintended consequence of allowing building more close to the shore, if I understand the, the math correctly. That's what's been testified to. Right. That's, so the comments were to that effect, right? Yeah. And keep in mind, I'm, it's not that I'm trying to be evasive. It's just that I very rarely am allowed to go out and make these determinations. The code officer is completely independent of the planner. He reports directly to the town manager. Those decisions, I am not familiar with them unless a project has also have to go to the planning board. And that's the only time I see the, the shoreland zoning determinations. I think a workshop. I was going to say it would be for a idea. And okay. I can ask the code officer yes. to attend. OK. Then, at this point, would anyone like to make a motion? Thank you. Yeah. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that the proposed normal high water line definition zoning amendment not be recommended to the town council for consideration. I think it's. No, I think we want to. Go ahead. I think what you would 
And I know that's what you have in front of you, uh, but I think what you wanted was be tabled to the next okay. planning board workshop. Be tabled to the next planning board workshop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have Second. a date for that one? It would be the first Tuesday in August, which, just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. August 6th. Okay, I heard a motion. Do I have a second on that motion? Elaine? And all those in favor? Oh, any discussion on the motion? I'm sorry about that. Any discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? Unanimous. We will be work, uh, look, doing this again on August 6th at a workshop, and hopefully the code enforcement officer can attend and get into a little bit more detail on some of these questions you have. Thank you. Could I ask one question? Would you like me to suggest to the code officer that he also work up an alternative that would expand on the existing definition? Yes. Okay. That'd if be fine. We may start having a, an either or, which we've already looked at. A third. Would, would it be possible to calculate a couple of cash cases? Like one using the two I can, I, I can ask, I'm, I would suggest that he pick um, a property that isn't currently the source of any discussion. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to volunteer? No, 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 no. <laughs> I would appreciate some more detailed explanation. I mean, we always hear that the town of Cape Elizabeth is more restrictive with shoreland zoning. I would appreciate some explanation of exactly where in the ordinance that occurs and which words it is that makes that happen so we know we have a, a clearer sense of what we're doing as we make those definitional clarifications i've been asked that question when we've been adopting amendments i, I believe i can find an old memo that we That'd can be great. use thank you okay all right okay then at this point the last item on the agenda is for adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion? Oh, okay. Motion, we adjourn. Okay. Second the motion. Any discussion on it? No. Oh, seeing none. All in favor? All in favor of the motion to adjourn? Thank you. Any opposed to the motion to adjourn? Oh, it was unanimous. Thank you. We have adjourned. He's gone. Has anybody ever voted against?